I'm Susan Scott Parker, and I'm the moderator today. We've got very strict time limits, but I wanted to just set the scene, if you like, for our conversation. We have been looking in a partnership that involves the Essel Foundation, the ILO's Global Business Disability Network, and others, at how we do a better job giving people with disabilities the skills and qualifications that employers are actually looking for. It sounds straightforward, but it's quite interesting how often people with disabilities do not get the accreditation that employers recognize. And so the breakthrough has been this insight, first piloted actually here in Vienna by the Essel Foundation, and Michael will be talking about that, that we can take a technical training program, we can use the curriculum and the accreditation process established by Cisco, which is recognized by every chief technology officer in the world worth the, the job title, and tailor the program so that people with disabilities can come through readily and move into jobs. And we're now looking as a, as a, a, a group of collaborators, if you like, at how this model can be replicated in low-income countries and in the rest of the world in general, in a way which we hope will, in partnership with Cisco, really delighted to have Cisco with us today, enable a much broader community of technical training programs to open their doors and be truly attractive and skilled at adapting for a much wider talent pool. So that's what we're here for today. Those of you that are in the wrong workshop, now's your moment. And I'm going to start by introducing Michael Pischler. Now Michael has spent 20 years in the private sector as an HR director, so he's got an insight into the real world, if you like, from the employer's perspective. At the Essel Foundation, he's responsible for the training and employment initiatives here in Austria. I don't know how many of you are from Austria, but you will have seen some very innovative work with local employers in all the regions of Austria, helping to build their disability confidence while at the same time enabling the system to respond to their needs as the users, if you like, of the services that are intended to help people into jobs. So Michael is going to introduce the pilot that was run in Vienna and the learning from it and help us to understand who needs to do what differently if we're going to transform the job prospects of people with disabilities worldwide, because that's really what we're all about. Michael. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction. Uh, today I have the possibility to introduce you to a pilot project that we started uh, here in Austria a year ago, namely the so-called Inclusive IT Academy. First, very quickly, a few words about the project itself. Then I would like to speak about the learnings and the recommendations that could be derived from them. With this project, we wanted to show that digitalization can offer great opportunities for people with disabilities, but also show stumbling blocks that we should remove. The aim of this project was to show that people with disabilities can pass a recognized high-class certification, namely a Cisco certificate in the area of data security and data protection. We were not only focused on the learning process itself, we also have taken care of all aspects beside. What should you take in account when you offer inclusive trainings? What needs to be considered when choosing suitable candidates? How can the framework be designed so that graduates of a certification get a fixed employment relationship as quickly as possible? This project was co-financed by the Ministry of Digitalization and it was scientifically supported by a University of Applied Sciences, namely by Professor Rainer Leudl from the UNAM Graz University of Applied Sciences. So, as already mentioned, we looked closely at the application and selection process, then of course the qualification itself. This lasted a total of five months from January to May 2019 and was designed on the one hand through face-to-face -face lessons, one time a week, five hours, and web-based self-learning elements. It was important for us to find out how accessible these Cisco learning materials are, but also what challenges arise when several participants with different disabilities and needs are tough together in one classroom. 
The participants then carried out the standardized objectives Cisco certification. In addition, we looked at the challenges of finding a job. We offered internships and supported those graduates who got a job with onboarding in the companies. As you can see uh, on the slide, the training was divided into three phases. The first phase is basic knowledge about data protection, was imparted and awareness for different attack scenarios was created. Then in phase two, concrete techniques were tough to protect data and prevent cyber attacks. And in phase three, special knowledge about the legal framework was imparted in which the general data protection regulation was developed. The total attendance time was 140 course units, one afternoon a week from January to May 2020, uh, 2019, as I already told you. A look to the most important cornerstones, we had a total of 14 course participants with different disabilities, five people with autism, two people with visual impairments, two people with hearing impairments, one participant with restricted mobility, two with chronic diseases and two without a diagnosis of disability. And the age of the participants ranged from 18 to 60 years. The requirements we have defined for course participation was a minimum age of 18 years, English at a high school level, and functional, very important, yeah, functional access to the internet. <clears throat> On this slide, you can see all the stakeholders we were involved in this project at a glance. The most important message of a total of 14 participations, 13, 13 have successfully completed the Cisco certification. And in the meantime, eight of these 13 participants have an employment relationship. I'm placed to that one of them is among us today, uh, Stefan Michlitz. Uh, he has known work, he is now working for one of the largest Austrian consulting firms in the field of cybersecurity, namely the SEC Consulting Company. Thanks to our cooperation partners, of course, to Cisco, but also to the HTL Rennweg teachers who would have liked to come today, but unfortunately have, uh, they have to teach. <laughs> Thanks also to the consulting companies, MyAbility and Specialisterne, who are also represented here today and have supported uh, us in that uh, project uh, excellently. What are the most important learnings and recommendations that we can pass on the educational institutions, institutions from the project? By the way, we have summarized these in English in that folder, and you will get this folder in some minutes, and you can go deeper on the learnings and recommendations. Digitalizations opens up incredible opportunities for the qualification of people with disabilities. My appeal to Cisco and all the other developers of digital learning platforms is to continue the work very, very consensually and uh, on the accessibility of their products for a wide variety of disability groups. The best technologies are of no use if the general conditions are not taken into account. There are a lot of stumbling blocks here, sometimes only very small ones, that can make access to ed education fail. First, let's look at the application and selection process. Everything starts with the most accessible website of a training provider. Uh, is the website also accessible with uh, PDFs? 
Are they well structured? Are they clear and sim in a simple language? People with disability should be specially encouraged to apply. Uh, what is the entry level? Is it law? Uh, our recommendation would be as law as possible. When you register, at, uh, you should ask the question, what should we know about you when we get to meet you? Which special needs do you have? So entrance, invite potential uh, participants. That's very, very important in the recruiting and the assessment process. In the selection interview, focus on strengths. Question whether there is a suitable internet connection and hardware at home and find out which qualification requirements are really critical to succeed. The inclusive training itself, before it starts, please ensure a barrier-free building, especially uh, the toilet, should be accessible. The classroom should be flex with uh, flexible tables and chairs. For the technical aids, ensure a sufficient power connections. Provide additional rooms for group work or uh, for um, 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 solving uh, conflict uh, solutions. Um, placement of, of the uh, different groups of disability should be in mind, as you can see here on the slide. And before uh, to start, it would be very, very good to teach uh, the, the persons, uh, uh, the teachers itself, and you should involve in disabled peoples on that. Um, the learning material is on itself. Use large front, at least 14 point. Keep presentations as short and compact as possible. One problem we found out, out or a challenge is uh, complex graphics for blind people. Yeah? There we should find a solution. And it's imperative to provide electronic documents in different versions so that can be read by screen readers, um, especially, for example, HTML and Word versions. And last but not least, least, what are the learning recommendations regarding job placement and onboarding? Uh, try to build bridges to the potential employers and get them in touch with the participants as early as possible. Offer internships, offer advice to potential company on how to deal with people with disabilities and take away any doubt or concerns you may have. Offer support to the companies, uh, especially for the first days for the one boarding uh, processes. So as far as a small insight into the most important learnings and recommendations, all these points you are described in much more detail in the guide, which we provide uh, you with. The largest private training provider in Austria is very interested in taking up the idea of the Inclusive IT Academy and offering it in their regular program. We, as the ESL Foundation, will continue to support this. Finally, we show you a short video clip so that you can get an additional impression. So thanks for your attention. Heute stellen wir die Inclusive IT Academy vor, ein Pilotprojekt der Essel Foundation, das wir gemeinsam mit der Cisco Networking Academy und der HTL Rennweg ins Leben gerufen haben. Ziel ist es, einen Dialog zwischen Bildung und Arbeitswelt zu schaffen. Dazu haben wir heute Vertreter aus der Wirtschaft und aus dem Ausbildungssektor ins T-Center von Magenta Telekom eingeladen. Wir als Magenta Telekom freuen uns sehr, heute hier Host zu sein und die Veranstaltung bei uns im Haus zu haben, weil das Thema für uns wirklich wichtig ist. Wir arbeiten auch schon seit einigen Jahren mit Kooperationsprojekten 
Beziehungspartnern zusammen und haben beispielsweise Kollegen und Kolleginnen im Haus, die Autismus haben und haben da gemeinsam gelernt, dass Personen mit besonderen Bedürfnissen auch besondere Fähigkeiten haben. Die wesentlichen Stärken von Autisten sind äh, ihre Strukturfähigkeit und diese Strukturfähigkeit, die sich in die Arbeitsweise sehr gut integrieren lassen. Die Kernbotschaft an Unternehmen ist, das Engagement für Menschen mit Behinderung nicht als Wohltätigkeitsveranstaltung zu sehen, sondern wirklich als Business-Chance zu nutzen. Wir haben ja einen großen Tool an Talents und wir von Cisco, von dem Networking Academy Programm, sind stolz darauf, das zu unterstützen. We want education to take a fresh look, we need business to take a fresh look, we need people with disabilities to be brought in as expert advisors, so that we end up making it much, much easier for any chief technology officer to find exactly the talent they require from the broadest possible pool of talent. Wir freuen uns, dass unsere 14 Teilnehmer und Teilnehmerinnen, davon vier Frauen, die Ausbildung zum Thema Cybersecurity erfolgreich absolviert haben. Ich fand den Kurs äußerst interessant. Der, der Lehrstoff war spannend und hat viel Spaß gemacht und ich konnte meine Qualifikationen doch sehr erweitern. Von dem heutigen Event nehme ich mit Perspektive, Zuversicht, Neugier und natürlich ein wunderschönes Zertifikat. <lacht> Seid einfach offen gegenüber Menschen mit Handicap. Habt keine Angst vor Herausforderungen. Zu wünschen wäre, dass Firmen offen genug sind, um zu erkennen, dass auch behinderte Menschen einen wertvollen Beitrag leisten können, zumal wenn sie gut qualifiziert sind. Ich finde es fantastisch, dass jeder der Studierenden einen Praktikumsplatz bekommen hat, soweit auch die Unternehmen sind daran interessiert. Das Wichtigste beim Recruiting von Menschen mit Behinderung ist, dass die Qualifikation im Vordergrund steht und nicht die Behinderung. Wichtig ist für mich, dass Barrierefreiheit in die Curricula kommt der jeweiligen Universitäten und der Hochschulen und dass auch die lehrenden Personen etwas über Barrierefreiheit wissen sollten. Um Inklusion erfolgreich umsetzen zu können, braucht es den politischen Willen, die Unterstützung der jeweiligen Leitung der Organisation, die entsprechenden Ressourcen und es braucht den persönlichen Willen, der beteiligten Personen. The vision is that the educational establishment will take a fresh approach. It will ask, where are the skill shortages? Where are the talent that we are not reaching at the moment? And act as a bridge, creating a truly barrier-free talent pipeline across Austria. Meine Vision für die Zukunft ist, dass wir Veranstaltungen, die das Thema Menschen mit Behinderung haben, gar nicht mehr benötigen, sondern dass es Alltag geworden ist und dass wir sie vollständig in unseren Arbeitsalltag inkludiert haben. Do we applaud a video? I guess we do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that certainly sets out the case for why and gives an indication of how actually it doesn't sound tremendously difficult to adapt a technical training program like this so that more people can come through. I'd like to come to Cisco now and then to Pat Ramzik, who's been working at the adaption challenge in more detail. Um, and so turning to Farshi Tari, who is a very senior leader responsible for learning, which sounds like a good thing to be responsible for <laughs> if it's an academy program worldwide with thousands of academies, two million students plus, and I stress delivering courses in skills that employers around the world know they want. And so if you could set the context for us, and then we'll look to Pat for the ones that are being more tailored at the moment. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Susan. Appreciate it. Very excited uh, to be here with you all. Uh, humble and excited to be part of uh, this phenomenal uh, work that's just been gone, uh, and I'm learning more as we go through it. So we're really happy and excited to be part of this journey with you. Um, I, I decided to sit here and, and present, if that's okay. I'm hoping that the, the clicker would work for me. Pat was expecting to go next. Have okay. I screwed up? Should I go to Pat? Or can um, this be adapted? Okay, this is Pat's uh, slides. Either that, or if there's a way to kind of switch uh, to the uh, to my slides. Either way, I, I if you want, I can uh, present Pat's slide too. 
Perhaps we go to we go to Pat with less technical aggro. It's my problem, my fault. I'm sorry. I got inspired. I thought it would make more sense to go there and then there, but as ever, I. <laughs> Pat and I are old colleagues, so I'm sure he can present mine and I can present his. Uh, that's one way. Exactly. We can, we can finish each other's sentences, I think. All right. Appreciate well, that. Great to hear your voice. If my technical colleagues yeah. would let me know, how should we proceed? We have it now. Oh. Excellent. Farshi? Thank you very much. You that go. was really fast. Thank you. My apologies. Good Excellent. cooperation. Well, that's, that exactly. is. That is about cooperation. Exactly. So I have a few slides. Very quickly, I want to get, get through that, introduce uh, the Networking Academy program with you. Uh, and uh, the, the impact of that, where it's been and where we hit it, talk a little bit about uh, what we provide for uh, uh, people with disability, uh, specifically within a program. And hopefully uh, I wrap that up quickly, we get to the conversation. Uh, at Cisco, we believe that people uh, and technology innovation together, uh, they form and create bridge, bridge to possibilities. This is more relevant than, than ever uh, with the massive, uh, disruption in technology, so we're all aware of that. There are so many different things, uh, digitization, digital transformation, industry 4.0. However you look at it, we know that there's been a major impact in, in all industries around the world. This shift and impact and disruption creates, uh, has created, is not created, has created um, a, a significant shortage in skilled workforce. This is a skilled workforce with digitization background. So this is more relevant than ever to start looking at how are we going to invest in human capital uh, development. That's the investment that uh, uh, the Cisco is, is doing their part as well. So what I'd like to do is introduce in a, in a couple of slides what Networking Academy is, that Cisco is funded by Cisco, obviously, and uh, how it's trying to solve some of these skill gap problems as we go through. Cisco Networking Academy is the longest run in and probably one of the most successful CSR programs. CSR stands for Corporate Social Responsibilities. Its mission is giving back uh, uh, to society right, and environmental related. So uh, it's an education to employment uh, program with a heavy focus on IT skills. Right? And now more than ever probably related to digitization skills as we speak. Our vision is, uh, list, uh, is, is shown on the slide, as you see. The vision is about building a best workforce development in industry related to the IT and provide opportunity for everyone, everywhere around the world, to job, job opportunities. What do we offer? Um, again, given it the short time that I have, this is at the highest level, at the macro level. Um, our learning experience consists of uh, three major areas. One is what we call learning portfolio, then the learning tools, and then there's a platform. A learning portfolio is where you, you heard from Michael multiple times, uh, uh, various uh, courses and content. I think you will hear uh, similar things from Pat and others. Uh, this is where our course offerings are. Uh, what we offer is a technology-related training. It's about the skills. And what we believe the skills, although it might come in a content and the courses in a digital format and you can read, for you to master that, you really have to have access to uh, what we call learning tools or a, a spectrum of learning tools. Uh, physical devices, uh, equipments that you can use, and as you can imagine, for certain disability, uh, touching and, and acting and accessing the actual device make a lot more sense. Places that equipment might not be available, we provide simulation and visualization. These are more of a software that you would use to, uh, uh, to simulate similar thing that you in the real world with equipment. Labs, obviously, uh, but labs is about uh, bringing people together as a team to solve a problem. So a lot of that has to do with the technical. At the same time, you learn how to work in a group, uh, work on the problem solving. So it's more of a soft skill. How do we collaborate with each other? Last but not least is around assessment. Assessment, uh, we have a strong engine around that, the testing and assessment. The way we look at assessment is not a pass or fail. It's more about test for mastery. Because in any test and any exam, you learn something, right? So that's sort of the philosophy. The combination of learning portfolio that we offer. Main focus in learning portfolio would be around domains of networking. Uh, obviously, we work for Cisco. 
programmable infrastructure. This is a next generation of where networking and software worlds come and collide together. And then cybersecurity. I think we heard about cybersecurity, so I'm not getting into the details of any of them. This learning experience are, is, is, is offered through an online uh, platform. This is a cloud uh, platform at a global scale. And, um, and it has a learning management system and various things that uh, is, is suitable for uh, individuals to access these learning experiences. So a quick look at our impact. Now I introduced what the vision is, what Netacad is about, what we offer within Netacad. What is, uh, what is our, uh, how, how, what's been our impact? So it's a global program. Uh, we talked about it uh, at the beginning. Um, our impact is, um, is broad and is diverse. We, we, we reach this uh, impact through um, private and public partnership with governments around the world, uh, Ministry of Education, um, nonprofit organizations, and uh, mostly with uh, educational institutions. Right? A large number, and you see that the stats and numbers are here with the education and educators around it. Uh, operating in 180 countries, uh, since inception, so over 20 years, uh, we have trained over 10 million, 10.9 million students through our, our program, uh, with a run rate of over 2 million student, active students on an annual basis. Our target in five years is to be 3 million annual. One uh, quick point, uh, we talked about the, the learning pl uh, platform that all our content, everything is offered through. Um, the last uh, upgrade of that platform was about six months ago, last July. But within that upgrade of new technology, uh, we started collecting more information, more effectively gathering information about people with disabilities. So we offer four uh, options of uh, vision impaired, the hearing uh, challenges, uh, mobility, or cognition. And uh, any, any students or learners that uh, interact with the, with the system uh, they have an opportunity to identify themselves, but again, this is up to them. It's not a must, it's not a required field. If they would like to, they would uh, identify themselves. For the last six months, sort of a volunteer mo uh, model, you have over 26,000 students in our platform identify themselves as uh, some, some form of disability. We looked at the impact. Now bring it all together, what is our commitment? We're very committed. To people with disability, uh, as I mentioned, the Net Networking Academy is a CSR program. Its focus is on underserved community. A few points that I, that I highlight in here, I want to go through it quickly, and maybe uh, others will, will cover some of these, and then maybe in the Q&A I can continue. I'm looking at the time. Um, first and foremost, our learning portfolio platform. Michael talked about it as well. Our product, uh, course, curriculum, and platform, they comply with the standards in accessibility. You're all familiar probably with the different terms, different uh, standards in the market, WCAG 2.1, AA is what we follow. So that's our standard. Um, there's a detail around what we do. Um, there are various things we do for vision impaired, uh, whether it's uh, about the navigation, the keyboard navigation, the high uh, color contrast, uh, description, alt, uh, alt text, etc. So there's a slew of things that we do and we'll follow the guidelines. We created an online accessibility resource that you can access that uh, from, um, uh, you can access that from uh, our, uh, our platform that highlights the details of what is supported and what is partially supported in a form of, uh, an acronym for that is a VPAT, that's a documentation. More recently, we, we started the journey with our advisors, uh, with our instructors, we forming an advisory board. It goes hand in hand, with, uh, with, with a pamphlet that, that I just saw in here that Michael talked about as well. This is about talking to passionate instructors around the world, that we have over 27,000 of them, a portion of them that they have expertise in disability. They come together and help us put together best practices around the vision, hearing, uh, folks with autism, etc., and share that as with, with all other instructors, because we see one of the barriers is around educators to take this as an initiative and trying to, trying to address and help others. I'll try to wrap it up. So advisory board, I can. Or you get in trouble. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> so, I'll, uh, an adv so advisory board is, is basically a, a, a strong uh, area for us and I think there's, there's, there's huge potential. Last but not least, we know, we strongly believe that uh, opportunity, uh, that, that the talent is distributed everywhere. 
in the world. Opportunity isn't. Talent Preach is a new product that we built. It works with Networking Academy. The model for that is to connect the students with jobs. And uh, if you need more, more information about that, I will be happy to, uh, will be delighted to talk more about that. Given the time, uh, I close it with a, with a success story, an example of many examples that they've had within our program, but the one that I picked. These are all great, but what makes us really proud at the end of the day is with this program, we change lives. Uh, 30 seconds on Wilson. Wilson Nabera um, uh, was born in, uh, <clears throat> in Kibera as the largest slum uh, in, in, uh, um, in Kenya. He lost his earring at the age of five, and, uh, but he, just, he didn't stop. With a lot of support from the family and, uh, and people around him, he finished through the high school with the work with one of our nonprofit organizations uh, or NGOs, uh, Deaf Aid. Um, got into learning more about IT essentials. This is a foundation of the, the computer and servers, and then to networking, uh, networking uh, uh, skill sets, the CCNA certification. He's an engineer uh, that works for a company called Copycat. Um, not only he's changed his, his life, he moved his, uh, <clears throat> his mother and siblings out of, uh, um, out of Kibera, and now all live in uh, Nairobi. There's, there are many other examples of this, official and non-officials everywhere. We're just so excited to be part of this program. Sorry, I'm, I went a little over. It's fine. I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And it's always helpful to remind ourselves there are real human beings in the middle of this. So I think 30 seconds spent on Wilson is well spent. I'm going to move on quickly now to the person who thought he was talking when Rashid was talking, but Pat. Now, Pat. You've been a senior executive in, uh, in Cisco Systems itself, not the Network Academy piece of the work, but in the right. actual business. I used to call you the kind of head of the cloud. I could never figure <laughs> out your job title. But the point is did, that- Did you say my head was in the cloud, <laughs> Susan? I guess so. But the point is that since you've left Cisco in the last few months, you have been pioneering how you adapt and create tailored programs that learn from the best in Cisco, use their curriculum, and will, I'm sure, in partnership with Cisco, start to amplify across the Cisco world in the way that you're after, Fashid. But tell us about what you've been doing and how it might be replicated, uh, building on the work that the Essel Foundation did across Europe. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's, it's such a pleasure to be there virtually. I'm sorry I couldn't be there physically. Uh, I would have loved to have been there, honestly, versus snowy and cold uh, in gray Detroit. But... Uh, and dark, by the way, at the moment. But nonetheless, it's great to join you by by um, by Zoom. I'm going to share just a few slides, if that's okay, Susan, and um, just to highlight, really reinforce some of the conf what you've already heard um, from the two previous presenters, and you'll probably hear reinforce some of it from from Neil. But um, as Susan said, I was at Cisco for many years. I retired. A couple of years ago now, it's hard to believe that it's gone by that fast, but it has. Um, and um, once I retired, I focused my energy on trying to make a difference in the world in giving back and some of the great blessings that I got that I had from Cisco and other companies in the IT industry. I recognized that how having a meaningful job in IT transformed my life, and I wanted to try to do the same for others. As um, as Michael talked about, right at the time I um, retired. Um, I was in con conversation with the folks at the Essel Foundation. Um, I had worked closely with them when we did a hiring program at Cisco as well as Special Eastern, so it's great to have them in the audience as well. And we had a hiring program at Cisco when I was there for people with disabilities, and it was quite successful. But, but what we found is exactly what Michael talked about, um, and that is that while you know there's many opportunities that people with disabilities can can do, the reality of it is many of them lack the skills, the education, the work experience for many of those jobs. So we started a training program. Uh, subsequently, I worked with the Essel Foundation and 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 you know kind of provided some insights that led ultimately to the inclusive I ICT Academy that Michael talked about. Since then, this was a couple of years ago. I've been working to extend and expand on this great foundation um, in a number of other locations, which now we've had great success implementing in other parts of the world, which I'll talk about here in a minute. 
You've already heard a fair amount about this, so I, I won't try to repeat what you've heard both from Cisco and from Essel here prior to me. But I think to summarize this, you know, we all know employment is a huge challenge for people with disabilities. And even inclusive employers that want to hire people often find that, especially for knowledge worker jobs, many people lack the skills, experience, and education required for these jobs. So even if they want to hire them, oftentimes it's difficult with equal em employment opportunity laws and other things. So what we've done is we've created an inclusive academy built on the foundation of what was done in Vienna uh, with the Essel Foundation and the great work that Cisco does. And working closely with Cisco, we've built now a series of these, we call them bridge academies, um, academies focused on bridging the potential of people with disabilities to real job opportunities. So this is not a theoretical program of, you know, driving policy or other strategies. It's really on the ground trying to make a difference for human beings and help them get jobs. And it's been quite successful. So we built on the success of the program in Austria, um, implemented a program in New York City, one in Detroit, one in Orlando, one in Boston, and several more are in process now. I'll talk about that in a minute. And they are transformational. They transform lives because it unlocks the potential of people with disabilities, gives them meaningful skills and experience in IT uh, to get real jobs that are in high demand. Um, I won't, I'll skip through this because you all know, there are 1.5 million open global cybersecurity jobs today, 1.5 million. I'm helping set up a program like this in Boston. And I had a meeting two weeks, a couple weeks ago, and I, I did a search while I was in the meeting on ZipRecruiter, and there were eight, almost 1,800 network security analyst jobs within 25 miles of Boston. Um, when I talk to companies, they cannot find this talent pool. So you've got strong demand, you've got a huge demand for talent. At the same time, you've got this huge supply of potential talent, people, talented people with disabilities. What we're doing is creating a bridge between the two, essentially. Um, and it's, it's really working. And the reason it's working is these are US stats, but it's the same almost everywhere. So if you take an average population of 50 people with disabilities in Vienna, in Lisbon, in London, in Detroit or Boston, it's almost always the same. Only of those 50 people, only 60% roughly are going to graduate secondary school. Only four in 10 are going to go to college. Only one in six is going to graduate college. Only half of them are going to get hired. And only a quarter of them are going to work full time. So of this population of 50 people over on the left side of this chart, one, based on statistics, and these are, these are trends that have existed for 30 years, one out of those 50 people will have a four-year college degree, university degree, and any full-time work experience. One out of 50. Lots of programs focus on that one candidate. How do we better hire people with disabilities? How do we bring people into the IT industry? It's one out of 50 people you're looking for. What we're trying to do is focus on all the rest and bring forward people that are capable, that have the ability and the desire for a better life, give them the skills using the Cisco Networking Academy program that was discussed earlier, to get meaningful jobs and careers in IT. This is sort of the summary of what we're doing right here. And as Michael talked about, we're focused on not people with, you know, university degrees, but focusing on people left behind. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really working. So what we look for is reading and math comprehension. And as Michael talked about, the other thing he's talked about is how important student selection is. Most of these candidates, have been left behind. They are unemployed. They typically live at home. Um, maybe they have a part-time job somewhere at minimum wage, bagging groceries or something similar. Um, they lack confidence because they've been told from the time they were born what they're not capable of doing. And the last thing we want is to invite one of these people into this program thinking they're going to get certified and get a job and have them fail. So we are, we learned very much from the experience that Michael had with the Academy in Vienna. 
and we are really rigorous about selecting students that are capable. It's, it's not to exclude people, it's to include the right people. And um, that's really working because what we want to do is, is to transform these folks' lives through employment. So what is what we call a bridge academy and how is it different than a normal kind of typical Cisco academy that was discussed earlier? There's 12,000 academies in the world. What's different about this? Well, what's different is we de develop entry-level skills using the Cisco curriculum and certification. So both the previous presenters talked about the importance of certification. Really important because many of these students don't have university degrees. Many employers require a university degree. But if you have a candidate who is certified and skilled for a specific job targeting a specific role, oftentimes employers will overlook that four-year degree requirement, which we had at Cisco and many companies have. ATOS might uh, probably, Neil, has the same requirement. And they, they overlook it when you have someone certified for a specific job. Number two, this is delivered through a partnership. This is not Pat doing this. This is not Cisco doing this. This is not a nonprofit or NGO doing this. This is a consortium of partners in the community that deliver this program. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, Michael talked about the graduation certification rate in, uh, in Vienna. We've had the exact same experience. So now 130 candidates have gone through a program like this somewhere. 98% have graduated. 95% have had meaningful jobs, have meaningful jobs. Lots and lots of examples of the success stories you've already heard about. This is scalable. It's replicable. It's financially viable. It's fundable. All the participants in this ecosystem benefit not only in terms of alignment to their mission, but also they benefit financially. You've got 30 seconds, Pat. 30 seconds, Pat. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk a minute about this uh, ecosystem because it's quite important. Um, this is the community of partners that work together to deliver this program. And I certainly can talk more, whether it's in the Q&A or later, uh, about this. But it, it takes a village, so to speak. And again, this is built on the foundation of learnings that we had in Vienna. This is the history of programs that have been developed. Um, Raleigh, Vienna, New York, Detroit, Boston, Orlando. <clears throat> um, uh, we're working on programs in San Francisco, Lisbon, Nairobi, and as of yesterday, Bangladesh, as well as Detroit, additional programs in Detroit and Boston. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really working. It's delivered tuition-free to the students. It leads to certification and real jobs. So in summary, this is a transformative program built on the great work, um, standing on the shoulders of giants, um, that allows us to transform employment and transform employability for people with disabilities that leads to meaningful jobs and long-term career success. I'd be happy to answer any questions either now or later. Um, and certainly anybody that, if, if I didn't hit any key points, feel free to you know, reach out to me. Thank Thanks, you. Susan, and everyone there. It's a pleasure to join you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Pat. I think what was going through my mind as I listened was how we're challenging low expectations throughout this whole process. But it's low expectations often held by educators regarding the employment prospects of people with disabilities, as well as the low expectations of the employers. And so I particularly asked Neil, who is, Neil, I never remember your job title, very senior person responsible for accessibility across the entire Atos global empire of hundred thousands of people. How's that for a job title? <laughs> that'll, that'll do nicely. Well, that'll Thank do you. nicely. So Neil, give us your insight as you've been driving this accessibility agenda and of course apprenticeship programs that bring disadvantaged groups into the profession and so on. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be here We're, uh, with you in person. You have uh, an avatar. I'll wave at you. Um, can you see my screen? Can you just confirm yes, that you can see my can. slides now? Yep. Yep, fantastic. So I am the Global Head of Accessibility at Atos, and um, I'm passionate about getting more people uh, included in education and as part of my role I'm also uh, chair of the diversity board for the Institute of Coding in the UK which is a uh, consortium of universities and businesses uh, and all of the barriers that have already been talked about in terms of people having access to education through 
uh, right the way through their lives is something that these universities are also reporting. But there are systemic barriers to this inclusive education. So uh, there's a lack of access to assistive technology, lack of understanding of the benefits of technology for students with disabilities, unintentionally exclusionary pedagogy. So essentially, the way that people are teaching uh, is excluding people, and, and the people that are teaching the teachers are unaware of the fact that the way that they're teaching the people how to teach is excluding people. So there are projects going on right now. There's a research project at the University of Southampton that is looking at some of this stuff. And online learning platforms are some of the least accessible places on the internet. It's almost like you're going backwards in time. So uh, if, and that's a real shame because actually, um, you know, the, the flexibility offered by online learning is a great way to include people with disabilities. We know from the work we've been doing with Institute of Coding, for example, that the flexible learning has much greater uh, completion rate, much greater diversity, much greater inclusion with disability, of people with disabilities. So if no one knows what to do and how to teach, our first priority has to be to teach accessibility skills because we've got to fix the ecosystem. So uh, we need to grow the knowledge to fix the problem at scale because this is a problem of scale, at scale and of scale. We need to grow bigger. Uh, we need to develop career paths and a profession that accommodates people with disabilities and that can include people with disabilities in accommodating other people with disabilities. To create an environment where it's easier to train and employ increasing numbers of you know, talented disabled candidates. You know, we're not lacking in talent, it's opportunity and the infrastructure that is the problem. So uh, about five or six years ago, we, we went down the route of apprenticeships. Now, um, UK is a bit unusual in that there is a, a, a funded levy, so there are a taxpayer funded levy for apprenticeships. So big companies pay a tax uh, and then the education part is funded, so it's actually really cheap for organizations to employ apprentices. So we don't necessarily have the same degree requirement in the UK as others because we've got this really great source of, of uh, funded labor coming in and that we can train up. Uh, but I wanted to do this for accessibility. So, um, and I've been having real problems recruiting talented people with, this, uh, with accessibility skills uh, and we wanted to expand our talent pool and create career progression, etc. And of course, our clients need this, and especially with education coming on uh, um, and the legislation that's coming through in Europe and, and the US, there's increasing demand. So first time around, we took five individuals, four of which are still working in accessibility five years later. These are school leavers. Second intake, we took three people, all of whom are still working with us. The, you have the opportunity to uh, progress to degree level. The apprenticeship takes you to a foundation degree, so it's the equivalent of the first, level, uh, first year of a degree. And 40% of the current UK accessibility team are graduates of the Accessibility Academy. So you know, a really large cohort of, of all of the people that are delivering accessibility services within our organization have come through this scheme. So um, it's a mixture of in-class and on-the-job learning, 14 weeks of classroom training over 18 to 24 months, uh, combined with job shadowing, mentoring, using assistive technologies, working with people with disabilities, working on team projects, and knowledge sharing. Uh, typical stuff that uh, apprentices do, they travel, they work with uh, our clients across the organization, they work with external projects, They've been involved in delivering uh, web accessibility audits, supporting users with disabilities, doing sort of uh, workplace adjustment support, technical support, consulting, even engaged in actually the development of standards such as WCAG 2.1. So we do stretch them. But this wasn't enough because actually what we found was that although we had people uh, in our team that we trained, they got poached. Because actually, if we couldn't find the skills, the market couldn't find the skills. So what I actually then went on to do was look at how we could uh, grow this skill base across 
firstly our nation and get accessibility recognized as a, an occupation by our government, um, and then hopefully expand that out. So we've been working on a national baseline for accessibility apprenticeships. We have been working with the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Skills um, and education providers, and I've been leading a consortium of people. And the great news is that uh, we've just had our proposal approved and are moving on to the next step. So accessibility will be recognized in the UK as an occupation and a career path for everyone going forward so, um, by our government. So in that standard, we've got application testing, report writing, development consultations, supporting end users, accessibility standards and guidance. We also teach people the skills that they need to be able to present to people to deal with stakeholders, to deal with the objections of senior managers and the pushback. So what we're giving people here is a well-rounded education. Just listed here are the, the kind of things that we're putting in, and we're working with organizations such as the IAAP to make sure that when people come out the other side, that they are professionally recognized by a, a recognized professional body in their field. So everything from design, the accessible fundamentals, uh, web design, how you support users in, in enterprise, because we have millions of users of in our, you know, in a digital workplace area. So that's very different to supporting an individual as a student. Um, and then in business practices, writing business cases, theories of uh, testing, etc. So it's quite in depth, but at the end of it, what we find is that people come out and um, they tend to stick in the business. So I'm really proud of the fact that even if people have left Atos, they're still working in the business many years down the line. And that this is the seed that we'll, we've planted that will help grow um, the accessibility skill base that we need, first in the UK and then around the globe, to start making our systems open to everyone. One minute. I'm done. Hey, wow, <laughs> very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. I wasn't sure if you were pausing to take a breath or if you were no, actually no, no, coming to a to, close there. I don't need Thank to breathe. You. Well, what an interesting combination of inputs for us. Before I open it up to the floor more widely for, for questions, because we have about 10 minutes, I wanted to turn to Stefan, um, because Stefan was referenced as a graduate of the pioneering program in in Vienna. And so I had two quick questions for you. One was, why did you, why did you go on the course? What prompted you to do the course in the first place? And then I'm going to give him the chance to tell everyone in the room one, what he would like you to do differently. So what, what prompted you to take the course? Uh, yes, my friend and uh, show me this. <laughs> you, it was just word of mouth that you found it? Yes. And were you uh, unemployed at the time? Uh, no, it was not employed at the time. And now you've got a job with this great big company. Yes. Good. But if you were giving advice to people in the room who were looking at making it easier for people in your situation to get jobs in the future in IT, what do you think they need to do? What would have made it easier for you if other people had done things differently? Uh, don't stop learning, and you only need the motivation to do this. Don't stop it. So don't get in the way of people that are really motivated to do it. Yes, right. Okay, well, I think encouraging that motivation and creating an environment where people focus on the positives and what's possible rather than looking at all the problems. Yeah. Yes. That makes sense? Okay, thank you. In addition, I want to line out, Stefan was looking for an employment since then more than 10 years. And now, he just started one and a half months ago after an internship and I got a very, very good feedback and all the people are very engaged about uh, your yeah, powerful uh, engagement. So good luck for your future. Thank you. Ten years is a long time to hang in. So can I open it up? Questions, please. Who's going to be the first? Yes, please. And could you say who you are for us? Yeah. Hi, I'm 
Christine Hoffman from the International Labour Organization. And I'm not sure I fully understood the relation between the Cisco Academy and the um, three talents, so um, apologies if I'm mistaken. But so, um, if I understood you correctly, so far with the Cisco Academies, you have reached a bit over 1% of persons with, with disabilities. So with the new model, with the Bridge um, Academy, you're hoping to increase that number, right? So with that model, you have opted for um, a specialized model and not for an inclusive one, which is what we're all talking about, right? Trying to make mainstream education and mainstream vocational training inclusive. So why have you opted for the, for the separate model? Before I ask Pat to comment on that, could I just clarify that these, what Pat calls the bridge academies, are separate from Cisco. It's just Correct. that they, they just use the Cisco, they just use, you know, they're lucky and fortunate enough to be able to use the Cisco curriculum and the Cisco exams, so they get Cisco accreditation. But they are almost a, a social innovation, if you like, initiative led by Pat and his organization, the, the Three Talents. So they are separate. But the question about why we have specialist programs rather than just mainstream through the 18, 16,000, however, I always forget how many academies, academies you've actually got, is a really important question. So could I start with Pat, why we've gone down the route of sure. these specialist ones, and then ask Parshid to comment on where the next step might be. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's a really good one. So two points, Susan, to reinforce what you said. The programs that I'm setting up, I, I, am, I do not work for Cisco. I did for many years, but I do not any longer. I'm retired. I set up a, a, a program to adapt what is a standard Cisco Academy program specifically adapted for people with disabilities. So it, there, there's a standardized program available, and that's what was discussed earlier. There's you know 11,000 academies in the world. They're all over the world. Um, but they are not focused on people with disabilities. Um, not that they're trying to exclude people with disabilities, but let me explain the difference and why we set up specialized academies. This is why the Essel Foundation, I think, did. Michael can talk to this. This is why we're doing it in all these other locations. There are 11,000 existing network academies in the world, 11,000 and change. They are focused on everyone else. They're not inclusive, generally speaking. The, the program, the technology is from Cisco, fully inclusive and a digital, and it can be integrated with a screen reader or any other accessibility tool. Nearly, so it's nearly not a fully. issue. But the <laughs> way the program is delivered is from a, typically in a community college or a, a school, a vocational school, they get the curriculum for Cisco, they provide it to the community, it usually costs money, it's not cheap, it's not completely accessible, not because Cisco's not accessible, but because the way it's delivered is not accessible. It may not even be in an accessible building. Very few of those students, some of those students that are in existing academies have disabilities, but it's a small percentage. What we're trying to do is to give people with disabilities a, an opportunity, a leg up, if you will. So we've created a program adapting what Cisco's done and made it free to the students so they don't have to pay for it. It's free, it's funded by government programs and development agencies. It's fully adapted and focused on people with disabilities. It's taught directly targeting the people with disabilities that are in the class. So regardless of whatever their disability is, we adapt the program to their learning ability. Um, and it's specifically focused in engaging employers who wanna hire people with disabilities. So what we're doing is targeting a population that has been somewhat excluded by the normal academies and making it more available, accessible, and adapted to people with disabilities. Did that answer your question? Yep. Or did I confuse partly, you further? Uh, thank you, thank, uh, thanks a lot. I mean, um, partly it has. The question is whether the next step could be that yes. you're trying to influence the other, the normal Cisco academies. Absolutely. And yeah. that's where I'm saying yeah. yes. Because Do you want to talk to that, Susan? Well, just that my aspiration is that we'll be demonstrating to the mainstream academies that they can be doing this, generating a demand for right. the business community for them to do it, and forging alliances with guys like this 
who are trying to promote the message that every academy out there should be attractive to and adapting for disabled students. So I see it as a, as a step towards that, that end goal. Arshid. Absolutely is. This is an excellent question. Totally and, agree. Uh, <laughs> and Pat, you covered this so well, so I'm not going to uh, go, go back to, to describe that. A couple of points that's just kind of, uh, just again, to clarification. So Neticat is a CSR program. Our, our focus is not just on disabled and people with disability. We looked at, we reach right. around the world with underserved that they need, the all other needs. But that's part of this audience that we reach would be disabled. Whereas uh, uh, programs like the bridge that the path is driving right now is exclusively uh, associated with disabilities, right? And the model for that is almost you have a large enterprise that drive in and you have a small startup. Smaller startup goes fast, like a speedboat, right? Versus the huge ship. They go fast. What they learn, since there's a connection is there, we're gonna incorporate all of that into what we do. We have the train, the trainer. I showed you the slide uh, a, little, a little while back, 12,000 academies or, or more, over 26,000 instructors worldwide. How are we gonna use this? Remember that I, I touched very quickly on the advisory board. So we have a group of instructor, passionate. They are already engaged, but as Pat uh, also brought up, not all 12,000 academies do that, right? There's a portion of them. Now we're gonna combine what we learn, what uh, IT Academy is learning. I mean, we went through the, all the recommendations there. What Pat is doing with the bridge, we bring them all together with the mainstream program like Netacat. Now you can feed this into a broader audience and academies around the world. That automatically brings this full through. Last point I make, uh, just again, clarification. Um, the CSR program that we offer is free of cost. We're not charging anybody for our, our program. But if the program is used right. by an uh, educational institution, they will have a right to charge the students for what they do. I just wanted to make sure I clarify mm -hmm. that. Is this and, and, and most of them do, right? I mean, yes. most of them do. They're Correct. not typically free. That's, that's very true, absolutely. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock timer. How much time have we got still? One minute. We've got five minutes? because okay, I think this is a really important question. Um, I really wrestled with this one, and I'm persuaded that actually this is pragmatic. If we can pull the learning out of who needs to do what differently in any given labor market so that people with disabilities can get Cisco accreditation, then we look at other kinds of accreditation, then you find out what training for trainers needs to be developed, mm -hmm. and, and you build the toolkit, if you like, which makes it much more difficult for the University of Manchester in the UK that runs an academy program not, not to get it right. But there was something here about the tuition fees that struck me as very important. Finding a way for students who, if tuition fees are significant, are simply not going to come through it. And so we still haven't uh -huh. tackled that one in terms of what the systemic implications are for the mainstream academies. Um, however, I'm, I just wanted to really <laughs> emphasize that most programs that help disabled people into work are really lucky if they get a 30 to 40 percent success rate. Often it's less. These programs get 80, 90 percent of those students into work. And so I think we have an obligation to learn everything we can from those specialist programs while pushing for the mainstream to, to start to really open up. And I don't mean just, just uh, Cisco. There are all kinds of technology-related accreditation programs out there. Pat, you can probably roll them off. SAP got one, and yeah. Microsoft, and EY, and yeah. so on. Microsoft, SAP, AWS. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm in conversation. To your point, Susan, I mean, there's an opportunity to take the model, and Cisco innovated this model. So kudos. Cisco developed a program that is, as was already mentioned, the most successful corporate social responsibility program of all time. It's available everywhere in the world. It's available free of charge from Cisco, and it leads to real certification. What we've done is taken that and adapted it for people with disabilities. But why couldn't we do the same thing with an AWS Academy, a Microsoft Academy, an Apple Academy, whatever Academy, right? A food service Academy. Um, you know, it, so the model is a model that drives employment, and we can adapt it to other curriculums. Well, pushing for the mainstream programs to get their act together. That's right. I really want to stress that because for me, it's, it's right. such a disappointment that we're even having this conversation when you look at some of those other academies. I am impressed at the extent of investment from Cisco in getting the technology to work in a way that I don't think the other academies have even begun to look at yet. Mm -hmm. So people are leaving, which That's tells exactly me we're right, running too. out of time.
Have we just run out of time? I guess we have. Is there one more quick question or observation before I close this session and thank our speakers? Yes, please, at the back there. Hi. Oh, Hi. it's loud. My name is Lena from the JDC Israel. I wanted to ask about the soft skills, employment skills. Uh -huh. Soft skills and employment I, I, Pat? Yeah, I, I can talk, I can, if you want, Susan, or do you want me to answer that as Pat? If you can answer it as Pat real quick. I can. We, we absolutely, this is not just technical training, it's ready for work training and soft skills training. What we try to do is have an integrated training model that includes the technical training provided by Cisco as well as soft skills and, and ready for work training provided by service providers. When I talk about this partnership ecosystem, that's what some of the players in the ecosystem do. They provide training and ready for work training. We also engage employers to lead directly to employment. So I, talk, I can be happy to answer more questions offline because I know we're out of time. I, I'd echo that um, when we're doing this for um, our academy, people already have a job because the apprenticeship is, leads to a job, but at the same time, right. they still need the soft skills. What we find with school leavers and, and university entrants is that they don't have the soft skills that, that business requires. So we build that into the course. It's really important. And that's what uh, actually makes people successful. It's not just the technical skills. In our model, we right. offered support in the soft skill. Okay. Well, I think now I have to say we've definitely run out of time. I would really like to thank all our speakers and thank you also to those overseas for taking the time in your busy diaries to join us via digital transformation stuff. And thank you to Cisco and thank you to the Essa Foundation. And thank you to you all thank for you. giving us your attention for this hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.